Today, I'm here with a bunch of Linux updates and developments in the last week. Right ahead of the holiday season, we're getting a ton of new updates being brought to Linux. First off, we're gonna start out with the Linux kernel 6.13, which is offering us even more Rust integration after some driver development has taken place. From Greg to Linus on this specific merge request, we have character miscellaneous IIO and whatever driver subsystem updates for 6.13. Here is the big and hairy char miss IIO and other small driver subsystem updates for 6.13 RC1. Sorry for doing this at the end of the merge window, conference and holiday travel got in the way on my side, hence the 5 a.m. pull request emails. What's particularly interesting here is that we are getting a bunch of Rust miscellaneous driver bindings and other Rust changes to miscellaneous drivers actually possible. I think this is the tipping point, which is a big deal coming from Greg to expect to see way more Rust drivers going forward now that these bindings are present. Even talking about the next merge window, hopefully we will have PCI and platform drivers working. And this is very interesting as we get more incremental adoption of Rust being in the Linux kernel. Of course, it's not replacing C, but it is being added as an optional language for very specific drivers and subsystems. You can see the careful adoption of Rust in the Linux kernel. And it's very interesting to see this coming from Greg. Crow Hartman, who is a major Linux developer responsible for a lot of subsystem and driver maintenance, including the stable branch. And this is a big deal for Rust on Linux, as it shows a practical step towards future kernel development with Rust in mind, and even more Rust development as Miguel Oyeda submits more Rust support, and who is responsible for the Rust for Linux project that's trying to add support for Rust language in the Linux kernel. Michael is a huge proponent of Rust in the kernel, and his update here introduces the next set of Rust support, with a lot of these patches being tested in the Linux next staging of the kernel. Hi, Linus. This is the next round of Rust support. Most commits have been in Linux next for weeks, except the latest three, which are a couple fixes to ignore Clippy Warning Flag Edition. Keep things clean for the upcoming release on Thursday. You already merged the VFS Rust file pull request, the trace Rust support pull request, and the net next pull request, which had a small Rust change. You may also get a character miscellaneous pull request as another VFS Rust pull request. Lots of pull requests being thrown around. Conflicts expect both the VFS ones, trace Rust and character miscellaneous. The conflicts aren't too bad. The resolutions in the next are fine. Please pull for version 6.13. So 6.13 is clearly getting rusty. I wanna hear from you in the comment section below and get your thoughts on Rust in the Linux kernel. It has been contentious in the past as Rust integration has the potential to deliver a safer modern language with hopefully maintainable code for what is the world's most widely used open source kernel. Will it have long-term success? I'd like to hear from you, but it clearly has no sign of slowing down. As another developer, Christian here, has added more Rust bindings for PID namespaces. More and more every day, we seem to be getting these updates for the Rust for Linux programming support. Let's move on to the next thing. Another big deal for Linux 6.13. Over 107,000 lines of code have been removed. In a huge staging driver changes for 6.13, the removals of the following staging drivers due to no forward progress and no one having either the hardware or the time or energy to deal with them anymore includes things like Fieldbus, GDM724X, OLPCDCon, RTL8712, RTS5208, VT6655, VT6656. These are getting removed because they're a maintenance burden. Removing these unused or unmaintained drivers reduces the complexity, freeing resources for other development. It also encourages contribution. If you remove these, it might motivate some people to revive and improve these specific driver sets by pruning this code out. Greg even says here, if anyone has this hardware or wants to work on these drivers, it can be easily reverted to get them back. But 107,000 lines of code is quite a daunting task to remove. So it's really cool to see the cleanup of the kernel as it keeps continuing with the latest 6.13 release. Now moving on to the open source desktop projects of Linux, we're gonna talk about GNOME here and its resources app enhancements. The resource monitoring app from GNOME is offering support for monitoring Intel neural processing units, NPUs, along with other changes and bug fixes. This is perhaps one of the biggest changes in the latest 1.7 release for GNOME resources. We're gonna, for those of you who don't know what GNOME resources is, it helps you monitor apps and processes, and they've actually just added a new temperature graph. Here is what the app looks like in both light and dark themes. You may have used this if you've used the GNOME desktop before. Anyways, the main point here is just to keep an eye on system resources, including things like CPU, memory, GPU, network interfaces, storage devices, batteries, and now we can add NPU to this list. And why did they add NPUs to this list? Well, neural processing units are becoming increasingly popular too there. 
due to the fact that they handle AI and machine learning workloads because they're very efficient at those tasks. And they're gaining traction, of course, with the ever-growing AI workloads that we're all having. It's nice to see that we have adoption. But look at the resources that we have available on our system, especially if NPUs are going to become some sort of standard for the computers in the future. Why wouldn't we want to manage and measure performance efficiency and scalability for these types of resources? It's very cool to see this being developed in resources. Speaking about open source desktops, I just got done making a video about Wayland. And if you're enjoying going through this information over the last week right now, make sure to smash that like button for me and take a moment to subscribe below so you can keep up with the latest and greatest in Linux and programming. You wouldn't want to miss it, but let's talk about a four year debacle on adding a color management protocol to Wayland. Well, it's finally getting some traction. This is again, a long awaited update for color management and it's finally nearing a merge. This is quite exciting because a lot of people have been looking for this. The aim here is color management extension is to allow clients to know the color properties of outputs and tell the compositor about the color properties of their content on surfaces. Doing this enables the compositor to perform automatic color management of content for different outputs according to how the content is intended to look. The idea here is to include certain defining output color features or characteristics like HDR or SDR support properties, which will let applications describe the color profiles of their content more accurately. And this will ensure consistent rendering of color across different devices and screens. So that's why it's important. It's a unified color management system. It's gonna give us more support like HDR, hopefully more client flexibility with precision and calibration opportunity. Now, this isn't a small task as it's been going on in and being talked about for the last four years. I'm just very happy to see that we're finally making some progress on this. You can see here some of the diffs being resolved over four years ago. Hopefully this is a pivotal protocol advancement that's gonna even more modernize Wayland. And if you're interested in Wayland and why it's taking over Linux, go check out my latest video called Wayland is taking over Linux to get an understanding and perspective of the Linux community in the comment section about what their thoughts on Wayland is, as well as why I believe Wayland is starting to take over Linux projects. Anyways, big news for Wayland. In this week's breakdown, let's talk about LibreOffice. LibreOffice 25.2 will be released as a final at the beginning of February 2025. We can check out the release plan, but what's interesting here is the Alpha 1 first pre-release since the development of version 25.2 in mid-June of 2024. Since then, 5,184 commits have been submitted to the code repository and 710 bugs have been fixed in Bugzilla. This is fantastic. And some of the most exciting things about 25.2 are here as this wonderful alpha release of the open source office suite, which includes things like updates to the writer with enhanced track changes. Clicking a track change highlights the corresponding entry now, and you can use the manage changes window, streamlining the document management process. We have improved DOC X importing, Asian phonetic guide, zoom settings, and other enhanced features. Calc has now support of import and export of connections.xml and OOXML. Impress has async interaction dialogues for click actions, improving responsiveness, enhanced SVG support, template improvements. Draw is now seeing added support for MS Visio templates. And then there's more general updates, including user interface, touchscreen panning and zooming to now work properly on Windows, new checkbox filtering for recent documents by current module only and many other updates. This is just exciting to see the latest and greatest development in LibreOffice, which is a massive alternative office suite to things like Microsoft Office. And I love to see the potential and impact on how users can use a free and open source productivity suite. Can't wait for the February release. All right, now on to some hardware for developers and tinkerers out there. There are two major things I wanna cover. And since we're getting closer and closer to the holidays, these might be great items to pick up for the hardware enthusiasts in your life. The Compute Module 5 is now on sale for $45. This is the Raspberry Pi Compute Module. But why is this so important? Well, there's really two reasons. One is for the industrial industry and the other one is for home users. Let's start with industrial. This new compute module, IIoT, by offering a high performance and scalable design that's modular. And a big reason we focus on this industrial application is because today between 70 and 80% of Raspberry Pi units go into industrial and embedded applications, which is a big deal. But for home users, it offers a compact, powerful, customizable platform for do-it-yourself projects. You can think things like home automation or edge computing solutions. It's just a very compact, nice modular design. That's, you know, 45 bucks, which isn't too bad 
to grab one of these and start developing something with a very small form factor where you can have a bunch of peripherals to develop whatever you want. Key features here include an ARM Cortex A76 CPU with Video Core V2 GPU, dual 4K HDMI USB 3.0, PCI Express 2.0, and Gigabit Ethernet. You have options for 8 gigabytes of RAM and up to 64 gigabytes of eMMC storage. With another version, we also have backwards compatibility with the Compute Module 4, which is all fantastic. Overall, this is really exciting as this modular computing device hopefully will bring the balance of power, flexibility, and affordability for both industry and hobbyists alike. Quite excited about this Raspberry Compute 5 module. I'll be getting one myself and testing it out. Let me know if you want me to show it off in another video. There's already many additional modules available for it, including coolers, antenna kits, cases, development kits. It's all there for you to start developing. And finally, every year, the Free Software Foundation suggests a few gifts that you can buy that are open source and have free open design. Although there wasn't much hardware being made this year, there are a few things that they're highlighting you could potentially get. For tech gifts that like this freedom message, here are the three main ones that they're suggesting. Think Penguin's VPN router, Technoethical's mini Wi-Fi adapter, and then, of, and then of course, DRM free books, music, and video, including some animated films from Blender Open Movies. The Free Software Wireless N Mini VPN Router version 3 boasts the fact that it respects your freedom, and when combined with a privacy-friendly VPN service provider, you can expect much more, like listed below. This is the first suggestion. It breaks down what exactly this VPN router offers for you. And then the Technoethical N150 Mini Wi-Fi USB adapter for GNU Linux. And right now, being offered at around 47 euros, it is quite expensive for what it is, but if you're excited about an adapter that respects your freedom, which means you can connect to Wi-Fi networks using only free software, this is a great choice as it includes a powerful Wi-Fi adapter, the Atheros AR9271, and it uses exclusively free software. This is a lot to cover this week as we had a prominent updates in the Linux kernel as well as open source software and hardware developments. I'm happy to go through all these things. If you enjoyed all that, don't forget to subscribe below. If you've made it this far, you're clearly enjoying the content. Make sure you follow along by subscribing and then catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to learn.savvynick.com now and get access to these sheets.